Hello Internet. Today I have what I thought I'll never have my hands on. Radeon 6900 XT. I remember back in the day of Half-Life 2, Radeon was a finger licking good in terms of build quality and performance, and most importantly, reliability. I myself advocated for ATI Radeon GPUs my whole life until I stumbled upon 1080 Ti. But that's a whole other story. So today I'm going to focus on the Radeon's latest and greatest GPU, which ended up on my bench for some reason with the cracked PCB. I thought cracked PCBs were a gigabyte thing. I think they are the leaders of the PCB cracks in the world, but I guess not. Anyway, I don't have much of Radeon statistics here, so I'll go with what I can gather from this one. And boy did I gather a lot. Stick around and you'll see all of that and more. It looks like someone had tempered with this card before. Warranty label was removed and the fans already disconnecting, so let's go under the cover and see what's going on. First negative impression I have is an airtight backplate with no pads underneath. This will do a superior job at trapping the heat, which we all know and love and just can't get enough of. 200 screws later, the heat sink finally comes off and what I see is this high-tech graphite thermal pad instead of our old beloved MX4. Looking here, it appears that Radeon was able to get its hands on these yellowish pads that are often used by NVIDIA Founder Edition cards. Those are impossible to find and they are really good, so my question is, why so little? The rest of the VRM and memory stack came with the crappy pads that leak silicone. You can see the residue that will eventually leak under the chip and cause all sorts of problems. So why didn't they go with the good pads all over? I'm gonna have to leave this one to you to decide. But I think we all know why. In any case, my biggest concern here is this crack, so I will address this first. As usual, I would like to dig as far as it would take for the crack to start to disappear. And as I do so, uh, whenever I see cracks start to disappear, I would stop and polish the area. Then I will flip to the other end and dig through a few layers to make sure that nothing's broken there. That looks okay, I'll go back to the front where most of the damage takes place and this is where I want to do as little digging as possible, so I won't have to restore too many broken connections. I'm gonna go ahead and polish this area real quick and see what's going on. And it looks like there is still some delamination, but uh, the crack did not go too f much further, so I'll stop. In case you were wondering, this is the grinding pen I use. I'm going to call this NWR Grinding Pen 2.0. It uses nail polishing tips. This pen is rechargeable via USB-C port and comes with an Allen wrench that does not seem to fit the screw very well in order to remove the tips, but it works. The grinding pen has three speeds and five speed indicating LEDs. My guess is by the time it reaches version 4.7, it will have all five speeds, but we won't know until then. In any case, let's put the card on this preheater that will take a very, very long time to warm up. This is the flux I will be using for this type of repair because it has two benefits over NC559. Number one, it does not coagulate. Number two, it does not get dark, so I can see what I'm doing. Number three, it does not contaminate the tip as a result. Number four, it costs twice as much. Next tool of choice is T115 handle with a micro tip and then we wait a century for this pad to heat up the board. Uh, 
A century later, the board has finally preheated enough, but still not enough. As you can see, I am unable to tin some of the traces, so I will blow hot air on top to make that process to go a little bit smoother. You can't see it right now, but I am blowing hot air on the PCB right now, and as you can observe, solder flows nice, and that's the way it's done. Now I will clean this air with alcohol and apply a solder mask protecting the lower layers from the wire that I'm about to run above. That way the new wire will not short to anything. And it looks like we got lucky this time, I only had to attach one wire at the front. And on the back, uh, all those exposed copper, I'll just tin it. This will not make it noticeably stronger, but anything is better than nothing. Followed by masking it with several layers, one layer at a time, so it's nice and strong. And when that's done, we're finally able to plug this card into the computer and see if it produces a picture. And it looks like it does not, so next step is to run a memory test. But before we do that, I'd like to power on the card to see the power consumption as well as the voltages present and where. So here we have 12 volt, 5 volt here. This one is USB-C with 0 volt because nothing is connected to it. This one here is 0 0.75 volt, 1.8 here, 12 and 12 in here memory with 1.36 and the core with the 0.9. Now let's inspect each phase with an oscilloscope to make sure all of them are alive. And now for the memory test. I will switch the motherboard to use built-in video adapter and the Radeon will be used as a secondary and then I will boot into this utility. Utility with fancy menus and options that you would think they do something, but none of them actually do anything useful. So what we're going to do is completely ignore all those stupid menus and press Q to exit to command prompt. Then we need to navigate to this folder here by using this command and then list all files and folders within by doing this command. Here we see a folder name closely resembles the name of our current graphics card. So we basically repeat the last command by adding that name to the command line. And we are inside of that folder. Once inside, a program called Memtune is located and we need to run that program by typing this command. And this process will take about a minute, after which we get a message that we have an error on E0 and E1. Okay, so we have errors on E0 and E1, but which one is which? Unlike Nvidia cards, AMD likes to switch their channels order with every other generation or so. As always, we start to count from the corner of the GPU, marked here. Then we go down the opposite corner and count counterclockwise as follows. C, D, E, F, G, H, A, and B. Thanks, AMD. Okay, uh, but the error said E0 and E1. What does that mean? That means that these are dual channel memory chips, two gigabyte each, one gigabyte per channel, which means chip marked E is both E0 and E1. And problem with this chip is likely related to the crack we fixed earlier. When PCB was bent around this general area, I can imagine we're going to have a number of root pads under this chip. Hopefully not under the core, but only time will tell.
chip is removed and left one of its pads behind and we have one rip pad on the board to take care of and as I work with the wick being as gentle as I can it seems that the mask on the PCB is just not taking it very well especially when the board is hot I think Radeon is making PCB mask layer from corn to comply with the Greta Thunberg demands for cleaner environment while she herself flying a private jet how dare you! AMD! You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your crappy boards! Anyway, I'm going to scratch the mask with my NWR grinding pan 2.0 to expose copper layer underneath and then I will tin that area before placing a pad. Once I soldered the pad in place and started cleaning the board with alcohol, I noticed the mask is starting to slowly dissolve. Thanks a lot, Radeon. I bet this PCB is so environmentally friendly that I could eat it and not get sick. Pathetic. How dare you pretend that this can be sold with just business as usual and some technical BS? In any case, I want to secure that solder joint with a mask by applying too much in the wrong place, so I will wipe that with alcohol and try again. This cheap Chinese mask is way better than whatever garbage Radeon used apparently. Also, while the PCB is still warm, I will apply a few more layers over the crack repair, carrying one layer at a time to make it stronger. And now, finally, let's take a look at the chip that we removed. Once cleaned, it looks like we have at least 8 red pads, so we're gonna have to put in another chip. Quick check for memory and 1.8 volt resistance. No shorts anywhere, so we'll plug it in and power it on. This time I will use this card as a primary source of display so that if it does output a picture, we'll know it's fixed. And we get a picture. Once the annoying repair dialog is finally over, drivers got automatically loaded and bam. There it is, RX 6900 XT. The device is working properly. Okay, reboot and assemble. Three hundred screws later, we're ready to pop this thing back in and run some stress tests. Let's see how well or not well this pinnacle of AMD engineering works. And yes, I am roasting both AMD and Radeon. Radeon for making crappy PCB and AMD for making a crappy core. You'll see why in a minute. Fired up Firmark and GPU-Z with hardware info. You can see that we have very little sensors in comparison to Nvidia cards. This isn't necessarily a bad thing for an average user, but for a tech like me, I really like to know what's going on with the card. In any case, my biggest concern here is the same that was mentioned by Gamers Nexus in his AMD reviews complaining about the very same thing I want to complain about here. Core is too hot. Specifically, temperature between the core and the hot spot is just over 20 degrees apart. What I want to see is 10 or worst case, 15, but not 20. So my first suspect is the thermal interface, which is this graphite film. This film is roughly 0.5 millimeters thick, so if I was to remove it and apply thermal paste instead, that half a millimeter will have to go somewhere. Not only that, but the rest of the pads would have to be half a millimeter thinner to allow PCB to drop half a millimeter lower than before. And as a result, heatsink will stick through the PCB by half a millimeter. And that's going to be a problem when installing the tension bracket. A suggested fix uh, to that problem was to use a half a millimeter washer that will go directly above here, where it's overlapping the pins that are now sticking through the PCB. 
and while that may fix the clearance problem with the core, it will introduce another problem with the card now getting bent. Also, as you can see here, when I tested the fitment without any modifications, core is not contacting the copper very well. Not only that, but existing pads will prevent the PCB to go low enough for a good contract, as it can be seen with my initial fit test, which means I will have to lower the pads by half a millimeter. I will, however, leave pads for the VRM alone because they are really close to a mountain holes where tension will have pushed excess pads away uh, on its own and I'm doing this at my own expense as an experiment so I would not want to spend too much of my own money and at the same time I would feel guilty asking customer to pay for what they don't really need. At least in this instance I didn't know any better so I decided to take a hit. One for the team. Once pads were installed Press fit shows very good contact between the core and copper and pads, which means we're ready to put these 300 screws back in one more time and run the same test as before. To my surprise, Gamer's Nexus complaint was confirmed. While this modification did drop the temperature by roughly 2 or 3 degrees, it still failed to lower the gap between the core and hotspot temperature by any significant margin. This looks like a good way for the AMD to ensure short life of their core. And Radeon complemented AMD by making their PCB from rice, dried vegetables and make it biodegradable and solvable by alcohol. The good news is, if the famine will come, we won't starve to death, as long as we have enough Radeon PCBs laying around. Yummy yummy. That said, I conclude this repair. If you guys like this video, please hit me with a like and a comment below. Also, please consider subscribing as a sign of appreciation for the content I am creating. Goodbye.